Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am here with Issa Guchardi, and we've decided to have a kind of spontaneous conversation about uh, the coronavirus. Um, and so we're going to uh, consider some of the, the issues that arise in a, a pandemic, um, particularly um, in relation to the fear and the panic that can set in, and really how we cope with those challenges um, from a contemplative perspective. So hi, Isa. Hi, how you doing? Thank you so much for um, uh, agreeing to join me so last minute. It was really just yesterday. I, I texted her and she said, how about it? So here we are. Um, so Isa, let's just get right to the 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 point. The point, of course, being that we are in this unprecedented time um, where, you know, countries and now states are in lockdown um, for, you know, uh, as it for in a, for completely justified reasons as a way to to control the um, the uh, the spread of what could be a really um, uh, horrible disease um, uh, is a horrible disease so but of course the 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 shadow of of this kind of a measure is the sort of hoarding mentality the panic the fear um, and then uh, and then of course compounding that of course is the lack of techniques and skills that many people have to know how to deal with it to know how to to feel okay. Um, so that's what we wanted to talk about. So um, my first question really is just, you know, why is it good? You've been talking about this is the time to practice. You know, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's almost more, more important to practice in difficult times. So why is it good to practice in difficult times? Well, I mean, I think that many times people come to a spiritual practice when things are not so hard, you know, often just because they're looking for like stress relief or something like that, which of course is important, but it's, it has, it's, it's nothing on the scale of trying to keep yourself steady in the, you know, on a raft steady in an ocean of, you know, supercharged emotions all around you. You know, it's one thing when you're, uh, you know, you have a, a stable external environment in which to practice in and to kind of get yourself, you know, on board but um, when, when the seas get a little choppy, that's when you really get the benefit of starting your practice. And, you know, I think that it, it's difficult for people to start a practice in the midst of a lot of turmoil externally, but it's still a good time. And, the, you know, often I'll, I'll tell my students, practice, practice now, because, you know, when you're, you know, I often relate it as Buddhists do to how you live is how you die, right? Mm, and because yeah. as you're dying, you're only going to have your practice. And if you try to develop your practice when you're not feeling well anymore, it's going to be harder. So it is a hard time to start a practice now, but it is still a good time to start a practice. And if you've had any kind of a practice up until now, this is actually a great moment to test it and to look at these different events that are happening around us and to see the fear and the panic coming up around those around us and try to understand what is the best way to respond? What is the best way? What can I do to be most helpful in this situation? And in order to be able to do that, you have to have some equanimity within yourself. So I think, you know, why is it difficult? Why is it a good idea to practice in difficult times? to test yourself and to help those around you. Yeah, so then a part of this is of course, um, uh, this common theme that we hear in contemplative um, teachings to respond rather than react. So what would be uh, a condition of reactivity that we could fall into right now? And what would be an alternative way of responding? Well, I think uh, I can describe that. I was at the grocery store yesterday. Uh, we had the lockdown order here in San Francisco, uh, you know, for midnight last night. So people were going to the store, and it was really interesting observing how people were reacting. And um, there was one woman. So her. So here's reactivity. Her reaction was, 
every three or four minutes, we were standing in a line. There was about 60 people in a line down a city block waiting to wow. get into the store, right? And so, um, so she was, um, every two or three minutes, she would take her arm, put it out in front of her and say, everyone get away from me. And she would go in a circle to the people in front of her and the people at back of her and anyone passing by on the, on the sidewalk. And she would just, she was sort of like a, a lighthouse, but it wasn't a lighthouse. It was like a dark house. <laughs> <laughs> dark house. <laughs> Shadow house. <laughs> you know, it was like going around, you know, it was like darkness going around in a circle there. And her face was pale and pinched and, and she was really, you know, anybody who got close to her, she was like a chihuahua, you know, just like, you know, and it was, it was pretty, um, it, that, so that was a reaction, right? So she's in full reactivity. And then, then the woman, I had so much compassion for her. The woman who was uh, one of the employees of the store was, they were, they were only allowing 10 people in the store at once um, because wow. yeah. um, they were overwhelmed, right? And so, and there were some people in line that were like, you know, come on, man, come on, we need to get in, man. you know, they were, they were like that. So they were in reactivity, but she was trying to respond and I could see how difficult time she was having because she was her, she was pale, she was taut, and she was, you know, you know, really having, you know, she, but she was being measured and, you know, you know, and I made a point of saying to her, and I'm not trying to toot my horn here, but I made a point of saying to her, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And she just kind of almost broke down, like the tautness where she was like, oh, like, it's working, you know, like it was a relief for her to feel like she was being effective, you know? Yeah. And, and, um, you know, and I think that, again, I'm not tooting my own horn or anything like that. I'm doing what probably what any one of the listeners here today would have done, which is to appreciate and to have gratitude for someone's effort. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's something that's, that's a response, you know? Yeah. And it was interesting because when we came out, when I came out, I got my, my things and I had my basket and she said, let me walk you to your car. And I was like, sure, you can walk me to my car. That's great. You know, but it was the reason she wanted to walk me to my car was because she really needed help. You know, mm. she was saying, I feel so vulnerable. Like she saw in me that I saw her, you know, yeah. and she wanted to talk, you know, she, she said, I feel so vulnerable. I, you know, she was probably, she looked like she was in her late sixties, early seventies, you know, and, and um, you know, she, she was like, I feel really vulnerable. There's all these people here and, you know, it's, I'm having a hard time. And, you know, you know, she, and, and I said, you know, I think it's, I think you're doing, I think you really need to rest in your, you know, good intention. She said, well, I'm trying to be grateful because a lot of people don't have a paycheck right now. And I'm like, and that's a really good thing to do, you know, to rest yeah. in that gratitude, you know? So I tried, you know, again, I, I, I was trying, she was struggling to respond, but she was responding well. And, you know, she just needed a little support. And so yeah. I was, yeah. and so yeah. I was responding in a way to try to, to support her. Right. Yeah. And so there's a real contrast here um, you, between, you know, our experience together and the, in the, in the dark house. <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, it's like, you know, I, I think one of, one of the things also you're alluding to is um, there is part of that reactivity is to kind of, you know, segregate oneself and to, you know, to lose that sense of community. And, and, and one thing that I've been observing as well, that's really beautiful is, you know, and people are posting things on, you know, the various social media outlets about, you know, someone put up a sign on their building, like, if you need someone to bring you any food, like, please yeah. call my number, you know, so people in their community are stepping up to support each other, you know, for someone who can't leave the house for whatever reason, because they're a more vulnerable population. Um, and, uh, and then also a friend of mine, Ryan, yesterday was posting about how, you know, these, you know, there were 60 people in an online yoga class, some yoga teacher had, you know, was offering a free class online. And so those ways in which we responded to the situation by, by, by trying to cultivate community and, and a feeling of, of, of support for everyone is, is, you know, it feels like one of these ways that we can respond right now. That's it's so right, Jacob. So right. So let's talk about um, 
maybe how and what to practice in difficult times, um, you know, specifically right now, Corona season. Um, what, uh, you know, obviously we we love meditation. Um, are there any other kind of uh, supplemental practices or any any ways of 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 um, being contemplative at this time that are, are you think are particularly fruitful? Well, I think that one of the things that probably all of us have coming up in our, you know, as, as we look internally is we are looking at fear. You know, I think, I think that most of us live in a state of fear to one level or another, and oh, we yeah, manage yeah. to distract ourselves. We manage to, um, you know, maybe find some kind of, you know, sort of a band-aid kind of a practice to kind of just quell the fear a little bit. But in these kinds of times, the rawness of our fear um, really emerges. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, you know, any of the truth is any of us could die at any moment. Right. But we kind of look away from that. Right. And, but when we have this, when we have this moment where we could die at any moment, much closer to our consciousness, that's a time to really learn about our fear. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, having, of course, having a, you know, you know, being gentle with yourself, if you have a kind of a practice that includes guides or guidance, uh, you know, or a, a, you know, a mentor or a deity to call in that compassionate presence as you're trying to work with your fear is, is very important. Otherwise you can really get thrown off. Mm. And, but then to, you know, to find like a stable cushion to be able to bring your fear out and really try to feel into the roots of it. So you can feel into your body and feel where the where the physical sensation of that fear is registering and do some deep breathing into it and let let your fear talk to you as you're breathing into it you know what is it that you're afraid of you know and and you know if you feel like you know you know a lot of us when we open to our fear we just have this like ah! you know like we can't get any kind of conceptual peace around it at all. Yeah. And so in that case, just to try to hold it compassionately or ask a known mentor or a guide to just hold us compassionately in it until we can stabilize. That's, <clears throat> that's really helpful. Um, it's also really helpful to really consider equanimity again. And, you know, this is one of the four measurables in, in Buddhist practice, along with compassion, which we've just speaking about and loving kindness, what we were just speaking about with the people putting signs in their windows uh, to help others and, um, and empathetic joy, of course, is the, is the fourth, but equanimity is, you know, it's, I often see uh, spiritual teachers kind of run, rushing across equanimity to get to compassion or loving kindness, because it's just, you know, I don't know why people do that, but they do. And um, less but sexy. I, I guess so, you know, I mean, they're all complex, but yeah. I think equanimity is one of the most complex states to try to cultivate because it requires so much of us. Mm. And we have to truly, when we're bringing equanimity to fear that's emerging, we have this this way of practicing. So the fear arises and then you're looking at where's the attachment, where's the aversion, and you try to get to the middle. The fear arises again, you get to the, you get to the, you look, okay, where's the aversion, where's the attachment? And you keep, you keep trying to get to a place of, you know, of, of, of true equanimity, not indifference, not disconnection, you know, you're looking for how can I be fully present with this thing and non-reactive? And it's very, very powerful practice. And it's a wonderful moment to practice because all of our filters are, or our usual distractions are stripped away. And yet we are not falling over a cliff or we're not, you know, very close to death on our deathbed. We have a moment to practice. We have an environment where we can practice and yet this intensity is there. And so our practice can become more powerful and we can make a lot of strides actually with this kind of a, a an approach. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that at that attention or that focus um, being placed on equanimity. Um, and 
and I also really appreciated what you said a bit ago about about death because I, I see that as being a huge factor, right? This fear of death. And of course, in the yoga tradition, it's one of the kleshas, right? It's one of the kind of um, the afflictions is this fear of death. And, and one could say, I mean, sometimes I say sort of provocatively or maybe not so provocatively that yoga is a practice of preparing for death. And you oh, could yeah. say, you know, all contemplative practices are in some sense that way. And, um, and then there's also, you know, it's interesting, right as the, the, uh, it started to get kind of dramatic, you know, in terms of the, the public response. I, last week I went to an off-Broadway show and it was called, we're all going to die <laughs> or we're going to die. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was kind of a one woman show with music. It wasn't quite a musical, but it was, it had music in it. And the last song that she sang was the, the lyrics were like, we are, we are all going to die. We're all going to die and it's going to be okay. And basically it was this, and then, and she had invited the whole audience to sing this song. And, you know, I told some people about it later and they're like, oh, that's morbid. And for me, I experienced it as just profoundly beautiful. This mm -hmm. shared acknowledgement of okay. the only leveler of humanity, you know, the true leveler of humanity, the, the, the completely shared experience that we all have, you know, again, you know, is beyond anything else is death. We're all going to experience it. And yet it is this thing that we avoid and, and try to escape from and try to you know avoid confronting and and you know in so far as we can become more comfortable through our contemplative practices with the fact of death it seems like these kinds of moments of fear could perhaps be less potent don't you think absolutely and i think uh you know looking at these moments as a way to practice for dying yeah you know? Like we don't get a lot of opportunities to really be as terrified as we're going to be when we're dying. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, no matter how much we practice, I I know I'm going to be. You know, I I'm going to be afraid too. Yeah. To right in. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, please let it happen while I'm asleep. <laughs> right, right. So so you know to to really you know to like really have our raw fear and. Of course, other other emotions, you know, like, you know, there's, as you were saying, Jacob, you know, where you, some people get into this really isolating place, as opposed to getting into a more, you know, community oriented place, when we, we have to confront those tendencies, because if we have, if our response to fear and to stress is to shut down and to go, to go into isolation, that's our relationship to the universe as we're dying. Mm, yeah. And that's not the the relationship that we want to have when we're living or when we're dying you know and if we have it's a natural tendency i mean maybe not natural not natural for everyone but for some people it's the way they protect you know and it's natural to want to protect yourself but when you're protecting yourself from the beauty of the universe and what it might offer you in a totally new situation as you're dying that's not the time to protect, right? You know, the time is, you know, the, 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 the task is to take refuge in your practice, to take refuge in your connection with all of the work that you've done to be connected to compassion, to loving kindness, to, to do all of the work that you've done to like maintain internal stability and to, you know, be able to face down any kind of, you know, grasping that you might have at holding on to the way things were or any kind of aversion to allowing the new the new experience to emerge and so you know it's it's just a wonderful time to practice all of this and you'll be more stable you know if if for instance like god forbid anyone should die from this you know if they, you were to contract yeah. the illness if you were to practice now while you're well and bring that practice into your sickness and you'll recover better and uh, you know and there's a whole thing to talk about in terms of a vibratory field that you create around you and yeah. how that can support you you know we can talk more about that if you want to well, why don't, yeah, let's talk a little bit about more about that. And then maybe we can close with, uh, would you be open to sharing a meditation that might help to cultivate that or just a meditation in general, I think would be nice right now. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. So tell us a little more about cultivating this vibratory field of, you know, um, I don't want to say wellness because that just sounds a little too, um, uh, cookie cutter, oh, but, uh, California. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, the, yeah, no, that I, it, it reminds me of sort of like, you know, 
pinks and blue and light blues that you would see on a on a you know wellness website. Uh, but um, <laughs> so yeah, so uh, ways of um, uh, or just more on that idea of this kind of vibratory field that you that can support you. Well, this this kind of addresses what you were talking about before in terms of you know having this fear like we're back to fear the fear coming up. Fear is a particular when you break it down. It is a particular vibratory rate, right? right. It ha it has its own energetic signature, and at the heart of all spiritual practice is energy medicine. It is the understanding of fields of energy, and so if you if you understand, okay. If I'm choosing to, to uh, and you, it is a choice there. I mean, I know there's times where you're absolutely terrified and you feel like you can't choose, but in this situation where it's a slow moving experience moving through the community, you have, you, you have a choice of where to place your heart and where to place your mind. And the place, and, and, and in order to be able to place your mind and your heart in a place that is supportive to you and others, you have to recognize that, it, that the supportive place has a vibratory field. And so, you're, so if you're choosing fear, the fear that the field is like this, you know, it's kind of yeah, tight, mm -hmm. right? And if you're choosing, like if you're choosing, for instance, equanimity, the field is more like this, right? And if you're choosing compassion, the field is more like this. Mm -hmm. And if you're choosing loving kindness, the fear is more like that, right? It's difficult to exp express in words, but it's very clear if you, see, if you see my hands and you understand the energy they're pointing to, and you really do want to create this field of, of equanimity, this open, spacious field, so that you have this stability to be able to meet any kind of fear that comes in to your vibratory field. So if you have this field that you're generating and that you're part of and that you're offering as a raft to others, mm -hmm. like, again, you know, you saw in that story that I told you about the woman in the store, she recognized that I, and I was actively cultivating a field of equanimity and compassion standing in that line. And she saw it and she recognized it, right? And she kind of swam over to it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you, and you want to be able to, you want to be able to do that for people and for yourself. And then what that does, it, it creates a counter current against all of this, is what you were saying is sensationalizing, the, the potential to sensationalize things, right? It, for, it creates a counter current of, of of a different vibratory field that can help and you can create more space for the more equanimous field, the more compassionate field. And that neutralizes all of the pandemic fear vibration that is sweeping the, the it's definitely sweeping the Bay Area. I don't know if it's sweeping New York, but. Oh yes, oh yes, I de we definitely feel it here. I mean, you go walk outside and, and I mean, bars and restaurants are closed. There's not a, there's not a complete lockdown now, um, but you know who knows if and when it will happen. Um, but people are certainly most people are staying home and and not going outside. And there's very few people in the streets. So yeah, it's definitely happening. Um, all right, so I uh, we we're about eight minutes away from our our thirty minute uh, attempted mark <laughs> okay. of completion. So yeah. why don't we, um, Lisa? Would you lead us through um, maybe a you know five to 10 minute meditation? Sure, sure, happy to do that. Okay, so just letting yourself get settled. Feeling your back straight, your feet on the ground or crossed and <clears throat> if you're on the floor. Just feeling your hands in your lap. And as you feel the support under you, just allowing yourself to notice where your breath is. Noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes 
and noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. And just allowing yourself to watch your breath moving in and moving out. And if any other thoughts should come into your mind, just let them pass through like clouds in the sky. And then just return to your breath. And just becoming aware of the way in which your breath is almost like a bridge between your outer world and your inner world. And just allowing yourself with each breath to draw a bit closer into your inner world, into that place where everything that you've ever known or felt or sensed or imagined is recorded. And as you come into this place, just allowing yourself to connect with any mentor or teacher or guide who has helped you understand yourself and the universe better. Just letting yourself feel that connection supporting you. And as you feel that support, just allowing yourself now <clears throat> to begin to contemplate this idea of equanimity. Remembering that equanimity means making yourself equal or making things equal. And just allowing yourself to know that when you have equanimity, you feel an engaged connection. You're not indifferent. You have an engaged impartiality. And just allowing yourself now, as you are focusing on the support that you have with your guide or your mentor, to bring to your mind someone or some situation that you have a lot of affection for or that you care about. And as you approach this person or this situation that you care about with your contemplative focus, just allowing yourself now to try to bring equanimity and engaged impartiality to this situation or to this person. And sometimes people feel like they might be pulling back when they try to do this practice with someone they care about. And allow that to be a, a possibility that this equanimity might pull you back and actually potentially create even more spaciousness 
in the relationship. And if you find yourself gripping or grasping, just note that. Note where it is in your body and breathe into it. And just let that gripping go. Just coming to a place of engaged impartiality. And then when you're ready, just come back to your breath, moving in and moving out again, just resting in your breath. And then when you're ready, just allow yourself now with the support of your inner guide or mentor or teacher to focus on a person or a situation that you don't like or that you feel judged by. And again, just allowing yourself to focus on this person or on the situation that you don't like, where you feel don't, doesn't like you perhaps, and try to bring a sense of impartial, engaged neutrality to this person or situation. And sometimes when we find ourselves trying to bring equanimity to this kind of a relationship, we can find a kind of pushing away within us or an avoidance that we want to bring to the situation. And if you find yourself feeling that avoidance, just noticing where it's rising from in your body, it might feel like a constriction or hardening and just breathing into that place and breathing out, letting that open, letting a bit of spaciousness come into the relationship. One thing that's helpful to remember as you're trying to bring equanimity to this person or this situation that you may not like is to remember that everyone like you wants to be happy. And just bringing this engaged impartiality and just allowing yourself now to no, you can return to both of these practices, but for now, just returning to your breath. And as you just watch your breath, just noticing if you might feel a bit more spaciousness within you. And allowing yourself to breathe deeply into that place of spaciousness that may be arising in your body or in your heart or in your mind. And just deepening that spaciousness with your breath, breathing into it and breathing out. And just recognizing as you generate this spaciousness in this way, you are creating a vibratory field that can act as a counterforce to any other energies, such as fear, and just deepening your connection with this field of spaciousness. that is infused with this energy of impartiality, 
engagement, and equanimity. And just letting yourself rest there for a moment. And when you're ready, just allowing yourself to begin to notice the surface under you again. Noticing your breath as it moves out can bring you back out into the room as you follow it. And with each exhale, just coming back a bit closer into the room. And when you're ready, just stretching a bit, opening your eyes, and just letting yourself rest in this field of spaciousness that you've created here, knowing that you can do this whenever you need the spaciousness. Thank you, Isa, that was perfect. All right, so um, I think we should just leave it in that calm space and um, and invite, I'd like to invite everyone who's either tuned in or is listening um, to uh, look at Issa's other wonderful offerings on her website at sacredstream.org, is that correct? Right. Yes, yeah. um, there's lots of um, free video and audio content to explore. Um, of course, with more of Issa's fabulous teachings, as well as uh, teachings from other friends of Sacred Stream on that website. Um, again, that's sacredstream.org. Thank you so much, Issa, for joining me and having this conversation. Jacob, thank you so much for everything that you do to generate and create and expand consciousness in the world. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Thank you for including me. <laughs>